Hello and welcome to Brand and Avat. Today we've got Helen Ziller with us, the former Premier of the Western Cape and the former leader of the Democratic Alliance in South Africa. And we're here to talk about her book, Stay Woke, Go Broke, um, which is about how American wokeness will impact in a devastating way South Africa's culture. Um, Helen, would you like to start with a story? When I first became acquainted with wokeness, it always seemed to be about stories in restaurants about middle class or upper class people who happen to be black feeling that they've been victimized in restaurants. So there were cases, for example, about people not being given a table with a view and seeing that as a fundamental act of racism. People not being given the spinach special when it was advertised as a special in the Hussar restaurant in Rondebosch and taking that as a racist slight on them. But the one that hit me most particularly was the story of Ashley Schultz at the very trendy OBS Cafe and Observatory, which is a student hangout where students go and have a good time. And two very privileged, I would put it, students, one a Rhodes Scholar, the other a graduate, went along there and encountered the waitress, one Ashley Schultz, who happened as it turned out to be facing particularly bad personal circumstances. Her mother was dying of cancer. She'd just been evicted from her flat because she couldn't afford to pay the rent. And she was playing, having particularly ghastly circumstances. And the Rhodes Scholar and his friend, who was a radical, non-binary, transgender activist. So I don't quite know how that all fits together, but I was very soon to learn came in and they sat down and they were served by Ashley Schultz, who happens to be a white female. And they wrote on the bill when she bought the bill, we will pay you a tip when you return our land. Now, the fact that Ashley Schultz was a young white woman facing particularly gruesome personal circumstances, had never owned a single square inch of property in her life, neither had her parents, was totally irrelevant to the woke narrative. She represented all of the evils of whiteness over the centuries by virtue of the color of her skin. And they, despite all of their privilege and advantage, represented all of the vulnerability, weakness, victimhood that whites had engendered or visited upon oppressed peoples and then promptly blamed Ashley for all of the sins of their benefactor, Cecil John Rhodes, who had bequeathed his legacy to give at least one of them a Rhodes Scholarship. And this seemed to me so absurd. And I really wanted to understand what was at play here, because that was the first time I think wokeness really exploded into South Africa's consciousness through that story, through the white waitress being blamed for the historical legacy of every iota of oppression that whites have brought to bear on black people, and black people benefiting from the legacy of the arch imperialist Rhodes, taking the moral high ground because of historical victimhood. And this was full of all sorts of contradictions. The average South African saw it for what it was, pure racism against a young white woman by two privileged young black people who justified their actions on the basis of their race and on the basis of their postmodern ideology, which really translated into the real world is wokeness. So one of the ideas I'd like to touch on is this notion that instead of judging people on the basis of their individual circumstances, um, wokeness seems to imply that you can judge people based on these other kind of characteristics. In other words, um, their race or their gender. But it doesn't seem to take into account things like economic class. So a lot of this sort of woke narrative seems to have emerged out of Marxism, which played quite a role in terms of understanding people in, in terms of economic class, but that bit has been dropped. So even though you have a, a poor person who has no property, uh, who is victimized by people who are quite well off, um, that aspect of their identity seems to be jettisoned in favor of these other kinds of identities. So can you tell us a bit more about how wokeness operates on that front? Well, where the relationship with Mark, where Marxism exists, is this idea that the world is divided into victims and villains. 
In Marxism, the line was drawn along class lines. So the victims were working class people. The villains were the bosses, the owner of capital and resources. The essential idea of dividing the world into victims and villains has been retained, but the fault lines have changed. The fault lines are no longer along class lines, but along race and other biological lines. So, for example, your sexuality, your gender identity, and so forth. Disability, uh, fatness, all of those sorts of issues, biological identity markers have superseded class divisions as the demarcators of the villains and the victims. And that is how wokeness distinguishes itself from traditional Marxism. The notion that the world is divided between good guys and evil guys has been changed in terms of the definition of the markers that differentiate those two categories. But the two divisions are essentially the same. It's the goodies versus the baddies, but biologically defined. So one of the concepts that you raised when you first told the story is this notion of privilege. And now when you've highlighted all the different um, gender identities, um, racial identities, different group identities that are at play when it comes to wokeness, how does privilege operate there? So firstly, what is privilege and how does it operate when you've got these competing identities, sort of this privilege Olympics where certain types of group identities are going to be seen as more privileged than others? Well, this is where wokeness runs into all sorts of problems for itself, actually, because you can accumulate victimhoods in wokeness. So if you're a woman, you get more victimhood points than if you're a man. If you're a black woman, you get far more victimhood points than if you're a white woman. If you're a black transgender woman, you get a very significant increase in your victimhood points. If you happen to be overweight or disabled or further marginalized in any way, that immediately ups your victimhood score. It's a kind of victimhood Olympics as people have defined it in the past. That's not an original phrase of mine. But it is a victimhood Olympics to see who can accumulate the most victimhood points. And what the critical idea of wokeness is, is that victimhood equals virtue. So the more victimhood points you can accumulate, the higher you stand on the virtue scale. And the more entitled you are to a point of view, to avoiding any challenge to your point of view, and to standing as the pinnacle of value and virtue in a society. So if I think about what things were like in South Africa during apartheid, we had this quite rigid race hierarchy where you put whites at the top, coloreds in the middle, um, colored um, for our American viewers means people of mixed race or Indian descent as we're racially classified by the state. Um, and then people that were designated as black at the bottom. And your your rights were done accordingly. So you really had this genuine structural racism, who you could marry, where you could live, where you could work, all designated by the state. And there was a sense that there some people are better than others on the grounds of their race. And it appears that what the system does is to acknowledge that pyramid and say, yes, that's totally right. Um, the straight white Christian males who are cisgendered are the best and the uh, trans lesbian black women are the worst. So if we just invert the pyramid, um, you know, then we can get to justice. That appears to be the idea. Instead of treating people like individuals, instead of saying, well, you happen to be black or happen to be a woman, um, and we're going to set those group characters aside and look at your particular set of circumstances, the idea is to still treat people like a class um, and then allocate burdens and benefits accordingly. Yes, the tragedy is that at the height of apartheid, and you were perhaps a little bit too young, but I was very, very actively involved in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa in various ways, we understood the antithesis of apartheid to be a society that did not classify people according to race, that judged everybody according to their qualities and not the color of their skin. 
that sought to give everybody an equal opportunity in life and that really sought to build a non-racial inclusive society. I never ever thought that as long as I lived, the apartheid classification would come back in a so-called progressive guise, that it would be dressed up as something favorable and progressive and something that we needed to accept that racial differences were the definition of your identity and your being as a human, as a human and your arbiter of worth. But that in fact, to deal with the legacy of apartheid, we would have to invert that pyramid, but retain its classification and its determination of race as being the arbiter of your value. And I never, ever, ever thought in a million years that that would come back as a progressive creed. The tragedy was that Verwurt, the architect of apartheid, was trying to banish blackness from South Africa. And now wokeness is trying to banish whiteness from South Africa. But the fundamental architecture of the ideology remains the same. So something I'm curious about is this incredible um, double standard when it comes to talking about whiteness and blackness. So if you were to utter the words, we're going to banish blackness from anywhere, whether it be South Africa or wherever, that would be seen as atrociously racist um, and, and totally unacceptable. Um, but if you say we're going to banish whiteness, you might get a lot of cheers these days uh, from, from the Wokarati. And I'm just so curious how, how work people are able to maintain this position, um, this double standard between um, derogating certain races and not others. Well, there's a profound amount of cognitive dissonance involved, but that also is aligned to the hierarchy of victimhoods and virtues. So to want to banish whiteness, which is by definition evil, is a good thing. To want to in any way even consider the notion of banishing blackness is banishing virtue, which is the epitome of evil. So it's this double standard, this notion of valorizing victimhood and giving victimhood virtue points on a hierarchy that explains it. So I think what you point out is that if you're a liberal humanist and a non-racialist, you think in the way that Martin Luther King thinks, which is the way that you should judge someone is based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And so if you hold that framework, having differential treatment for different races is incoherent. But if you don't hold that framework, as you say, no, all I do is I battle bad people and support good people. And it's very easy to work out who's good and bad. We just look at the color of their skin or we just check for their sexual orientation, and that's all information that we need, um, then there's nothing incoherent about the position. Um, but they're doing something very, very dangerous that we've seen throughout history. These are the kinds of um, wrongs perpetrated by very vicious fascist regimes in the past, when instead of judging people on the content of their character, they use the shorthand of these immutable characteristics. Well, indeed, um, indeed. And if you looked at apartheid within its own paradigm, it was perfectly logical. It made all kinds of sense until you understood that the paradigm was evil. So within its paradigm, wokeness makes all kinds of sense until you recognize that the paradigm is no different. And it's no different from all the fascist regimes in history that have determined who the good guys and the bad guys are and stomped on freedom in the process. That's what we're seeing here. One objection that's going to be raised, um, you know, we're a philosophy show, and so we, we always throw objections at our guests. Uh, so we Good. hope you don't, don't mind. So one of the objections that's going to be raised is, given this past injustice, this is the only way forward. So this is the only way we can r rectify that past injustice is by inverting. It's an eye for an eye. Uh, invert invert the, 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 the pyramid of, of racial privilege. Um, and, and that's how you achieve justice. Yes. Well, I would respond to that in a principled way and in a pragmatic way. The principled way would be as follows. You can't deal with a legacy of racism by more racism. That doesn't resolve the problem. It may invert the pyramid, but it reinforces racism, which is the fundamental problem. So that is my principal objection to that approach. But more pragmatically, 
we just must look at how it's worked out in South Africa. Now, all of the measures that have been put in place to invert the pyramid have not in any way led to the upliftment of people who suffered most through the legacy of the past. Quite the opposite. It's led to a tripling of the formal unemployment rate. It's led to massive impoverishment. And it's led to the extraordinary enrichment of a small politically connected elite that could benefit by the smokescreen of racial policies to advantage themselves, their families and their close friends to pretend that they were doing black economic empowerment when in fact they were doing black elite enrichment. And race was used simply as a smokescreen for personal enrichment. So the practical consequences have been diabolical. And I never thought I would say this, but the practical consequences for the majority of people disadvantaged by apartheid is that they are now doubly disadvantaged by this fig leaf of so-called policies supposedly meant to advantage them, but have actually done the precise opposite. So measured in principle and in practice, it's a con trick. So it seems like one can recognize that there is a duty on the state and on citizens to redress the wrongs of the past. And the temptation is to say, well, because people were wronged on the grounds of their race, that we should use a racial metric to fix those problems. But as you point out, practically, that doesn't work very well. And you wind up entrenching that principle of racialism, which is a tainted principle. But it seems like you could redress those wrongs in a non-racial method. So you could ask a couple of questions, for example, of someone like, have you yourself been persecuted on the grounds of your race? Um, which is not the same as saying, do you fall to become a, a member of a racial group? Not all members of the group will have suffered prejudice because of the passage of time. Um, you might also think about their economic situation. Um, and that it strikes me that the danger that you also hint at is that if you use race as the criteria and you end up benefiting the wrong set of people, so it might be, for example, the case that the majority of poor people in South Africa are black, but um, the people that are benefiting from affirmative action schemes um, tend not to be poor. They tend to be very wealthy because they've developed a business around empowerment schemes. So instead of helping those which you want to help, which are the poor and the vulnerable, you end up helping people that merely look like them. Um, and that strikes me as unjust. Well, precisely, that's exactly what the outcome has been. And we don't need race as a proxy for disadvantage. We can measure disadvantage. And you only use a proxy if you can't measure the thing that you're wanting to redress. So in South Africa, as we all know, we can measure poverty. We have old age pensions that are applied without reference to race. It depends on your income as an elderly person. We have child grants that are administered without reference to race on the basis of the income of the parents. So we have several interventions that are based on what you're trying to measure, which is poverty and disadvantage. And we don't need race as a proxy for that. 99% of people who would be advantaged by non-racial metrics are black people. But you wouldn't be re-entrenching race and you wouldn't be benefiting the 2% of the elite that we currently are benefiting while getting the poor into a situation where their poverty worsens incrementally. So one of the criticisms is going to be that race is a fundamental part of someone's identity. Um, as someone who, whose parents or grandparents or great-grandparents suffered um, discrimination because of their racial identity, they strongly identify with that race and, and feel that if, if you are undermining wokeness, then you're undermining their identity. Um, that they, they might, might call it color blindness. So for them, color blindness is a bad thing. And it's very important to re entrench those notions of race to, to um, bolster their identity um, and their felt experience or lived experience in the world. Well, what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I do believe that people should be allowed to self-identify. That is the key thing. And they should be able to say, my blackness or my whiteness is very important to me. As it happens, my whiteness doesn't happen to be very important to me, 
that it might be important to somebody else. But if I have to identify, surely a free individual can identify the aspects of their identity that are most important to them. The critical thing is that the laws of society must not move from that point of departure. Social norms have to accept every individual and judge and measure them by the same set of yardsticks in a free and open constitutional democracy. And if people wish to identify in certain ways, there's always a contradiction if there is an inherent advantage built into doing so. So if you know that you're much more likely to get a government contract if you identify as black and can put that on your CV, then that incentive becomes overriding as a driver of motivation. If the state says we don't give any advantage to the aspect of the identity that you wish to hold to define who you are, then you're like, much more likely to get an authentic representation of identity. So I think the state has to be absolutely neutral, has to uphold the sanctity of each individual to self-identify in the way that they would like, has to ensure that poor people have more and more opportunities, that freedoms are protected, that opportunities are broadened. But if you start giving advantages from the state to certain identity categories, that creates a whole set of perverse incentives around that categorization. And it is that that I have a major problem with. So that's very interesting because your view is that um, people should be able to self-identify and the state should protect that self-identification, but not reward it. So not for, the state should not reward a particular identification, but it should, it should guarantee that you are allowed to identify however you want. And that seems like a very important distinction. It is indeed. And that is why, for example, I would say something like someone like Rachel Dolezal should be able to identify as black if she wants to. Why shouldn't she? She feels she's black. She's the mother of two black children. The father of the children is black. Why shouldn't she self-identify as being black? Why should it be a scandal? Why should she be hounded out of society by people who claim that they can impose an identity on her? That surely is an individual choice. And the state must protect her right to make that choice, but not reward that right in any specific way over and above anyone else. And in that way, it would be an authentic choice. Yeah, this is a fascinating topic. So I, I think that idea of if you're a liberal, you respect people's autonomy and you care about freedom. And so you want to grant people this ability to carve out their identity for themselves. So if we think about, um, you know, society's views on on transgenderism we have you know become much more embracing of this idea so that if someone proclaims themselves uh, a different sex to the one in which they were born um the view is to say that that is a brave thing to have done and one that um that person is perfectly entitled to have done and and is um you know seen as quite a virtuous thing to do and it's interesting that it doesn't seem to track on the trans race so someone like rachel dolezal who you know also went to, in America, they have these um, historically black colleges is how they refer to them. So she was, I think, at Howard College. Um, she was um, a leader in the NAACP, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, and had this identity and I think, in other words, had a sincere belief in it, but was then outed as being a liar in the sense that she was um, trading on a false identity. And that's strange. In other words, this notion that we think that race is essential it's the kind of thing that you could be right or wrong about um, and you could lie about um, whereas something like gender the view is you cannot be mistaken um, and all you need to do is make a proclamation so if i now identify as a woman then i am a woman i wouldn't need to take any further steps beyond that i wouldn't need to go through any surgery or go through any hormone therapy uh, the current cultural norm is that identification seems to be sufficient the other person who's written about this very well is um, a good friend of, of the show, Rebecca Tuval. Um, and she sort of said, well, you know, if we think that both of these categories exist 
and we think that the right thing to do is to respect um, a transgender person's choices, well, maybe we should think the same with regards to respect and, you know, uh, equal treatment and dignity with regards to people that are transracial and of course she was attacked and sullied and there were calls for her her paper which had been published in Hypatia to be retracted and calls for her to be fired um, and this strikes me as a sort of puzzling situation it's recently occurred with Richard Dawkins as well who had his um, award from the American Humanist Association uh, taken away from him for, for merely posing the question by the way not taking a position one way or the other but just saying this seems like a contradiction, let's talk about it. And it's not possible to talk about it. Well, this is the absurdness of the whole thing. You know, it's the absurdness of the whole thing. When I was growing up, we were taught that race was a social construct, that race had no scientific basis, that human chromosomes were almost absolutely similar, except for the tiny little markers that gave you dark or blonde hair or whatever it gave you, but that race was not a mark of human difference and that it was entirely a social construct. That is how I was raised in a non-racial environment in a highly racialized society. And it was progressive in those days to think of it like that. However, sex was seen as based in biology, having a physiological basis. And um, obviously, if you want to live in a tolerant and decent society, and if people feel that they're trapped in the wrong body, one respects people's rights to identify as a different sex and, and be transgender, absolutely. And I'm delighted to say the DA has just had a transgender candidate in, in a by-election in which we did actually very well. So that is all great and that's human progress. But to suddenly essentialize race as being an absolutely key biological and scientific arbiter, uh, um, arbiter of difference is just absurd. There's absolutely no scientific basis to it. So something that both you and Mark have hinted at in this discussion is this notion of cancel culture. And it seems to be a very big part of wokeness and um, bolster it up or uphold it in important ways. Can you speak a bit more about how people are canceled and how that relates to wokeness? Well, this is a fascinating thing for me because it happened so suddenly. Suddenly, almost overnight, it became completely taboo to have opinions that just the day before yesterday were standard common sense. The notion that race is a social construct. The notion that there are physiological differences between males and females that are biologically based. I mean, yesterday that was just scientific sense. And I can understand that things move on and that there are debates, but to be entirely cancelled because you want to question those assumptions seems to me totally absurd and absolutely antithetical to liberalism. And how this culture has assumed the mantle of liberalism in the United States shows me how totally perverted the concept of liberalism has become in the United States. The notion that people can be ousted out of society and driven off social media platforms and even out of their jobs because they hold a view that suddenly overnight has been decreed to be unacceptable by some arbiters, faceless arbiters of what people may think, the thought police, seems to me so absurd in a modern democracy that if you told me that when I was growing up, I would have thought George Orwell got it right. He absolutely got it right. There are these thought police who police everybody's views on issues and you put one foot out of line and you get cancelled until you are driven out of your job. And the most extraordinary thing is how lily livid and how weak the major corporates have been. Instead of defending people's rights to have a different opinion and to have a different opinion that just yesterday was a rational opinion, they buckle and bow and scrape to the woke mob for fear of reputation damage. And of course, the minute they're doing that, well, there's all kinds of openings for people who want to abuse that scope and destroy their rivals who are more successful perhaps in a business than they are. James Charles comes to mind in 
the United States. I think he said something that was out of line and his opponents in the beauty business came out and effectively destroyed his career. And he had the loss of billions of rands in promotions and sponsorships and various other things. And it is just too easy a cover for the most vicious form of professional jealousy and violence, frankly. So the title of your book is Stay Work, Go Broke. And I think it's interesting to dwell on this notion of how workness operates in a marketplace and how you might require a sort of distorted marketplace. So on the one hand, I think you touch on something really important, which is what a wonderful weapon to decapitate your enemies in the market, you know, to create a scandal, to have them, you know, have the mob riled up, you can destroy their business, you can, you know, get them exiled from society, and then you can prosper. And you can play this game, either in politics or in business, and it works very well if you want to do it to your, you know, competing journalists inside your own organization, like was done to Barry Weiss, you know, it might be a great way to kind of climb that corporate ladder. Because we think ordinarily the way that you have to compete in a market is be, by being meritorious. You have to be good. You have to have a good product. You have to have you know worked really hard. Um, and instead, if you have this additional avenue of being able to succeed, which is sculping your enemies, and being able to say that by being a sculper, actually I'm fighting for social justice. I'm a virtuous person. You should reward me. You've got this perverse market incentive. But the other aspect to it is that the general populace just don't seem to buy it that if you ask the average Joe about these sorts of issues, they either just say, look, we don't read the mainstream press anymore because we find it vile. It's, it's covering issues that, you know, we don't relate to. And so you've got some other, you've got some other thing going on, which is why are those publications that have produced work content, who've had their ordinary market consumers desert them still around? And it seems like there must be some other fiddling going on in the marketplace. In other words, one way that you could survive is not through that ordinary method of, you know, consumers rewarding you for the product, but through some other kind of external mechanism. You know, in South Africa, there's a concern that um, journalists were paid off um, by members of government to push a particular narrative, uh, to run um, basically campaigns that would um, serve to distract from, you know, bad things committed by politicians. And so I wonder if that's how it survives. In other words, these work empires aren't going broke because they're being cross subsidized by someone else with a malicious interest. Well, that's a very interesting point that you raise, and I'd like to extend it further from individual journalists to entire newspaper groups. If you look at the so-called independent newspaper groups, one of the most ironic names that has to exist, they were bought out by a front for Jacob Zuma. Uh, Iqbal Survey's media group bought them out for two billion rand borrowed from the the uh, PIC, the Public Investment Corporation, which was which paid far, far too much money for it. And instead of putting journalism and service to readers front and center, they drove an ideology first and foremost. And the ideology was radical economic transformation and opposed to so-called white monopoly capital. And they lost readers hand over fist to the point where the Pretoria News in the capital of South Africa has 1,900 subscribers only. Now you can imagine what that is for a newspaper that circulates in the capital. And all of the other newspapers have lost readers hand over fist, but because they are effectively still sponsored by the South African government through various fronts, I have absolutely no doubt, they continue publishing, but no one takes them seriously. Today, whatever they publish, no one actually even bats an eyelid about because we all know exactly where that's coming from and what the purpose is. So they've lost their muscle, they've lost their influence, they've lost their cachet. And um, that is, eventually they will run out of other people's money and they will grow, go broke. So there's, they've gone broke as far as readers are concerned. So the irony is that many corporates and others are terrified of social media, even though social media does not reflect what the public out there think. And this is a massive disjuncture. And I'm hoping that over time, things will just calm down and we will be able to completely ignore what people say on Twitter. You see, with me, it was very interesting. I had a big cancelling, as everybody knows, and I write about that in my book. But it was very interesting when one of Jacob Zuma's former bodyguards came to speak to me 
he'd had a conversion to Christianity, and I think that that is what lay behind his coming to make a clean breast of it with me. And he said that they had been trying to find things on me for years and years and years. In fact, he himself had personally been sent to inspect every single tender and contract that was awarded while I was the mayor of Cape Town to check whether there wasn't any family member of mine who was benefiting from those tenders and contracts. They failed to come up with anything over many years. And in the end, because they knew that I was an active social media user, they just thought that they would monitor my social media posts. And I'm very outspoken, so I was always outspoken there. And at roughly the same time, they got the Bell Pottinger, which is the South African equivalent of Cambridge Analytica, onto the scene. And they were harnessed to do a lot of reputation destruction in exactly that way, in mobilizing the networks of bots and sock puppets to destroy people on Twitter. And then dutifully, the mainstream media and opinion formers followed suit as if Twitter was the voters' role. So one of the pernicious effects of woke culture is that it destroys the line between true racism and prejudice and perceived racism and prejudice, um, where that perception is based on a very strange set of principles about what counts for racism or homophobia or transphobia. Um, and I, I wonder if you can just speak a bit more about that, about how implicit racism has become as bad, if not worse, than explicit racism. Well, obviously, racism, often racism isn't even implicit in any form. But the first law of cancel culture is to decontextualize and distort what another person says or does. So the first thing you do is you take it out of context and distort it. Now, we had a classic case in point a couple of weeks ago in South Africa when a reporter who happens to be a young person of color, Lindsay Dentlinger, was interviewing people during the COVID pandemic. And her counselors took very carefully selected snippets of these interviews over a period of about six months and managed to select a number of clips in which she was asking black people to please wear their masks during the COVID pandemic, but hadn't asked white people to do the same, even though in reality, she asked many, many white people to wear their masks and didn't ask many, many other black people to wear their masks. They selectively did a cut and paste and then use that to build a narrative that she was a racist by arguing that she obviously thought that black people were spreading disease where white people weren't spreading disease. Now that was a completely manufactured set of circumstances based on a highly selective uh, set of clips on um, choosing various things that suited the narrative juxtaposing them and then creating a totally vile and false narrative that Lindsay is a racist. And instead of going head to head with them and saying this is complete nonsense, look at everything in context, look at all of the interviews that I had on that particular day, look at how there's absolutely no difference overall between the black people and the white people that I interviewed on average. And instead of her employers coming out to defend her, they were all falling over their feet to apologize and saying they didn't mean it in that way. And it's this problem, you buy into the decontextualization, you buy into the distortion, you buy into the lie, and you reinforce it that way instead of fighting it. So something you touch on is this move to force an apology. Um, that's in the book, you, you write about this exceptionally well, which is these different steps to, to cancellation. And you set that out in great detail. Um, but the idea is that it culminates in an apology from the person. And I think that apologies really have changed quite a lot. In other words, if you and I had a fight and I said to you, you know what, I think I did the wrong thing and I apologize. The purpose of that apology would be to restore our relationship. And at some juncture, you might think you might even have an obligation to forgive me if you feel it was sincere and I've made sufficient amends and, you know, our relationship would be, would be restored. It appears that that's not what's going on in these cancellation cases. That first of all, those that are seeking the apology don't know you. So they're random people on Twitter, maybe some of them aren't even people, as you say, sock puppet accounts or, or bots. Um, and then when the apology is extracted and the idea is to extract it as quickly as possible because the person feels maybe all the suffering will go away if I just say I'm sorry, it's then seen as a concession of the merits. 
It's then to say, ah, you admit that you did a terrible thing. And of course, um, it is not a good enough apology and it could never be a good enough apology for whatever reasons. Um, and now it's a matter of working out what your punishment needs to be. Um, and so it seems to be the case that apologizing in this context just seems improper. It doesn't serve its original function uh, that people ought to resist apologizing um, because it's not about restoring a relationship. It's about destroying someone. Indeed, that's exactly what it is. And the steps in wokeness and in cancel culture, very particularly as a manifestation of wokeness, are all about destroying people. Because if you can destroy one prominent individual who disrupted a woke narrative, you can silence a whole category of people. So it's the most effective form of censorship. If you can take one high profile person who uttered a heretical idea, which has suddenly become heretical, five minutes ago it was fine to say it, but now suddenly it's become evil and heretical to say it. If you can cancel and drive out of society and pre preferably out of their job, a person for that, you suddenly find that you've had a chilling effect on society as a whole. So it's the most effective method of censorship there is. And that's the objective, to enforce particular speech codes because to the works, language is violence. So what is the history of wokeness? Where does it come from? In South Africa, it seems like we've had an impact on America, but perhaps America's had a larger impact on us in terms of where these ideas originate. Well, I think in recent years, America's had a larger impact on us because there is no way that any South African would ever have thought that race essentialism would become progressive. That is what we're trying to get away from and have been since the darkest days of apartheid. So the entire DNA of South Africa's struggle against apartheid is in non-racialism and in believing that we are all inherently equal and that we have to fix the great wrongs of the past by ensuring that everyone has equal opportunities and equal chance in an inclusive society. That's what it's always been. And if it hadn't been for the sudden surge of progressive racism, as I call it, in the United States, and the power of the internet in carrying those ideas here, I don't think that they would have taken root as they have. And this notion that unless every space is decolonized, it carries the original sin of racism. So you have absurdities like decolonizing libraries and you have absurdities like decolonizing universities. And of course, this all came on the tidal wave from American universities in their humanities faculties, which have very close links with humanities faculties in English speaking countries worldwide. And suddenly critical race theory, postmodernism, all of these ideas became unbelievably progressive. And a younger generation that mostly hadn't lived through the horrors of apartheid seized upon them as the solution and believed that they, if they could mobilize and utilize self-interest in the, in the form of mobilizing on a racial basis to exact historical justice, somehow we could dismantle past discrimination not realizing that what we were actually doing was destroying the capacity of any institution to function in South Africa anymore, destroying the very basis of the capacity to deal with the legacy of the past and make our capital and skills the number one export of this country, which is going to be a total disaster. So what's interesting, as you say, about this call for decolonization is that it appears to be quite a new call. So if you think about the African National Congress's foundational document, the Freedom Charter, it specifically on, on education talks about opening up universities to the treasures of, of, of the world's wisdom. You know, the idea was that it's not about removing knowledge that you've gained from the West. It's about trying to expand knowledge. It's to recognize that the only way that you make progress is to build on the shoulders of giants. And instead, the move is to say these things are tainted. They have a bad history, so they should be expunged. And we've seen that play out, not just merely in academic articles, but in physical actions. So during our Fees Must Fall protests, you had people burning works of art um, on the grounds that they were, you know, colonially tainted. Um, we recently had, um, 
the African Studies Library burned down due to a natural disaster at the University of Cape Town. And some people cheered this on as a sort of decolonization effort to sort of say, isn't this a wonderful thing that these books are being burnt? And of course, the tragedy of it is that a lot of those materials are irreplaceable um, and are important for for South Africans. I think there's a, an, an early cause of dictionary was one of those things that was destroyed. Um, and similarly, as Jason alluded to earlier, there's this dialogue with South Africa and America. So, you know, both countries have had a history of, of racial repression and both have done things to sort of fight against that. Um, but if we think about, you know, the the move to, to remove certain statues from South African universities like Cecil John Rhodes, you know, that's been replicated abroad in a big way, you know, um, during um, protests in America, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement destroyed a number of, of, of statues. Um, and the sort of threshold for who gets removed sort of seemed to be kind of arbitrary. Um, so there were calls for Lincoln statues to be removed, um, even though, you know, Lincoln fought to abolish slavery. Um, the other thing that's a funny thing about South African America is in America, they often talk about minority rights mm -hmm. um, because people of color are a racial minority in America, whereas in, this, uh, in South Africa, it's the reverse. In other words, um, white people are a racial minority here, and um, there was minority rule to the exclusion of black people. So this kind of holus bolus incorporation of critical race theory to South Africa strikes me as uh, improper in a lot of ways because the landscape is quite different. Well, let me get right to the heart of it, which is going to be very controversial, but it's something that I believe very strongly. If you're going to go from the point of departure, that good and evil in its historical roots can be explained by race and defined by race. You can, to some extent, hold that up in the United States of America. The indigenous population was decimated. The colonial power established itself. There was a civil war. There was slavery. So if you want to delineate good and evil on the basis of race, you can make a case for it in the United States of America. You can't do that in Africa. Delineating good and bad on racial grounds in Africa is very, very bad historiography. The indigenous people of South Africa, the Khoi and the San, were decimated by the move of the Bantu African people down the East Coast and whites on the west coast arriving by boat rather than overland. Slavery in Africa has a long, long trajectory rooted in black slave owners. And indeed in some countries it continues to this day and the African Union is still protecting those slave owning societies in Africa by refusing to identify who they are. The Mfekane, which decimated upward of a million people and had a massive displacement effect in Eastern and Central Africa or South, South Africa is a devastating historical development. So to define the difference between good and evil on racial lines, of course, everybody knows about apartheid and that was a historical evil, but it's certainly not the only historical evil. And if you want to break down good and bad in Africa on racial lines, it is very, very bad historiography. In fact, it took the might of the British Navy to stop the export of slaves from Africa by African slave owners. So let's get that right in Africa. No one has a monopoly on good or evil because of their race. I don't think that people have a monopoly for good or evil on the basis of their race anywhere. But if you want to be radical and go back to the historical roots of good or evil, it's very, very difficult to do that on the basis of race in Africa. So one of the questions that that I ask um, after just reading the, the cover of your book, um, part of the subtitle is why South Africa won't survive America's culture wars and then in brackets what you can do about it. Um, do you think wokeness is going to win? So, so, so do you think we're, we're doomed um, to get this imported uh, set of theories which don't, um, which don't apply well here in South Africa um, and don't apply well anywhere? Um, are, are we doomed or is there some way to overcome this? 
Well, South Africa has always had the clock stuck at five minutes to midnight for as long as I can remember. It's been for very, very, very many years. And we will be doomed if we shut up. We will be doomed if we do not mobilize and expose what's going on for what is going on and fight back on that basis. And I'm a great believer in fighting back. I fought apartheid all, all my life and I'm fighting the new apartheid too. And I don't um, draw any great distinction in morality between the two forms. I reject race essentialism completely and I reject the evil of the past, colonialism, apartheid, slavery. I also am not so naive as to believe that it only came from one side. And I believe that human societies progress and that you cannot keep blaming the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of previous generations for their forebear sins when they weren't even born at the time and they would like to make a contribution and build a new country. And we're either going to build a new country together or we will find that our biggest export is our capital, is our skills, is our commitment. And we'll see if we have a better society as a result. I don't think we will. I think we'll have a much worse society. And the first point of departure is to speak up, to speak out and to mobilize. And there are lots of forms of mobilization in South Africa, which are very encouraging. And many of those take the form of compensating for state failure from the private sector right through to the solidarity movement. And they're making great progress as far as that's concerned. But ultimately, the saving grace of a society is one that votes out a corrupt and self-serving government. And that is crucially where the Democratic Alliance, of which I'm a member, comes in. So I think you're right to point out that fighting back is important, that if people are concerned about the way their society is going, you know, it's not enough to remain silent, you know, that evil prospers when, when good people remain silent. Um, and it requires, you know, an, an immensely strong spine to do that because the stakes seem to have been raised. So those that that speak out, um, you know, will, will suffer social sanctions and possibly lose their jobs and things like that. So it appears that it's hard for individuals to do it, but we need to try and create a culture of of tolerance of different kinds of ideas so that in other words people say look i don't like what you've said but that's okay uh you know I, I think you should have the right to say it and when i say that you have the right to say it i mean that you have the right to say it without sanction in other words you won't be hauled before an equality court um or, or have your you know have your job taken away from you or be ruled out of the organization that you work for so how do we try and change the cultural tide so that you know people start to see free speech not merely as a right but as a value so that we can tolerate views that we disagree with and see it as an opportunity to change each other's minds? Well those of us who can speak up must and that is where I feel that the universities are letting the society down so badly. They were so brave under apartheid and stood so firmly against race essentialism and race classification and today they are so meek and mild and um, supplicant to this new crazy trend which violates every constitutional principle we have. And most professors and things have tenure. Why don't they speak up? Why don't they challenge? They're safe. They aren't going to be cancelled and thrown out of their jobs. And it seems to me that these fantastic safe spaces that have been created very specifically for the purpose of being able to challenge predominant ideas are totally failing in that regard. So. Those of us who can speak up, and I can, I'm not, you know, I obviously nearly lost my job as well, but I fought back very, very hard against that mad wokeness that gripped our party for a while. And not that I can claim to be innocent in having created it. I mean, I have a critical role to play in doing that, and I, I have faced up to that and look at that very carefully and with a lot of um, self-flagellation now and again. But nevertheless, those of us who are in a space where it's possible to speak up without losing your job have a moral obligation to do so and to make it safer for other people to do so and to write the books that other people can't write, but give them the arguments that they might need. Well, I want to thank you for an absolutely delightful conversation. Um, I think we've managed to really talk about some of the pivotal ideas. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book um, and uh, I hope that uh, our viewers enjoy reading more about it too. That's really great, Mark and Jason. Thank you so much for everything that you've done um, to help advance these ideas. It's quite extraordinary how a few people 
in a context like this can make all the difference and give a whole lot of other people a lot of courage they otherwise wouldn't have had. So thanks for that. Thank you, Helen. And to everyone watching, um, you can purchase Helen's book on Amazon or if you're in South Africa on Take A Lot and we're going to post links below this video.